Stick up things mainly within territories. I think there will be some overlap. Now, most of what I'm going to say is actually incredibly boring. Um, so I put up some pictures. I said, you don't like the boring stuff, just watch the pictures, try and work out what they are. I'll give you a clue. The first ones at the top there, place are, are both old and one of the lovely road mergers that uh, reminds me of the days of my youth in England when we still have such things there. So, I should just say that our forum, as many of you know, uh, it is a grouping of conservation bodies across the OC territory trying dependencies, um, and uh, all our work is concentrated on trying to uh, help improve cooperation between. So, what I'm doing wrong? Yes. Okay. Um, this is probably the emphasis slide. Um, and it's a generalization. There are obviously exceptions. We're trying to compare what government policy do and what NGOs do. Government bodies have the benefit, I think, the only benefit of having an official position, but they have responsibilities. Um, they have the disadvantages of uh, sometimes leading to reorganization of ministers and departments, of staff turnover typically, um, and leading to corporate loss of memory. Typically, secure funds and government officials here don't. About too much of that, but compared with NGOs, they do because of their, their tax and things. Uh, challenge publicly, decision making, if it's not very detrimental. Uh, and in the UK, they can give evidence of parliamentary inquiries. They tend to have higher continuity of the personnel, uh, and um, provided their funding, they can maintain long term uh, experience and programs. They have less secure funding, particularly in recent years, uh, but they are open to a wider range of funding sources. They have flexibility, uh, again, if they're all resourced, uh, and can be more reactive. They're able to harness volunteer and charitable donations much more easily. And if they're not paying, we are in fact to recover tax on donations from taxpayers. The, the, um, I've worked in both sides of this equation, and uh, I agree with the report produced by DEFCA um, a few years ago about how important it is to the territories of conservation. And particularly as we all work in all administrations, that collaboration between um, NGOs uh, and government bodies can be really important. Various roles being picked up by agreement. 
I've just put just a few examples here, like the Guernsey biological records. I'm not just Guernsey. Old list, uh, one I'm just taking the lead with Ramsar issues in collaboration with governments. In terms of cables items, uh, the NGO managers got more into rent reef damage. Uh, get here. Look at the situation pre 1987, which is when the forum uh, was formed. Within Britain, I think it's fair to say there was pretty good government NGO coordination. Uh, and that was also therapies, also. But uh, it's also fair to say that the therapies was on poor. For the current dependency, it remains largely non existent. But it, 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 the, 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 there is a case that the therapies um, are owed some sort of harm. So we target helping local bodies and indeed the official bodies to, to form or develop uh, and as in meetings coordinated jointly by ourselves and the so uh, the UK government suddenly decided to make those meetings to continue. Yeah. Um, prior to organisation, inter-territory meetings were rare, especially the government bodies, until about 1999 onwards when we started our series of occasional conferences for conservation practitioners. Um, well, and then we had regional work groups, which nowadays meet by Skype, which is uh, quite helpful. Uh, and recently, also, um, probably the lead from the Gibraltar Minister, uh, we started these uh, environment as council meetings, uh, which we've probably taken over for. Looking at some of the changes and challenges at the UK government end of things, um, up to about 2000, the two main UK body coordinating support. Um, for conservation of the territories, where ourselves, for the NGOs, and FCA for the governmental bodies. And over the next few years, we, the two of us, had some success in pulling in other UK government departments. Um, DFID, DEFRA, British Defence, I put the Ministry of Justice in brackets, those are the current benefits in my life, um, uh, JMCC, uh, and uh, the, the Department of Energy and Climate Change, and so on, and the various uh, manifestations. Um, and these government bodies then spent some time talking themselves to get their line degrees. They, they stopped talking to the NGOs. So it's a benefit with a disbenefit we've done to it. And uh, progressively over these 20 years, the conservation grants to the OC territories, I know the current benefits don't get it, uh, moved from a collaborative sort of approach, which was a the less sharing of advance of plans by those bidding, because they thought by sharing the plans in advance, they would lose, reduce the chance of getting the money. The money. And we, we could do work to try to reverse it. Also, the structure, operation, branding, and funding departments of these grants have changed. And, and over the last 12 years, uh, there have been at least four different systems in play, which again doesn't help on security. Um, there's also been a decreasing involvement of the panels deciding grants yeah, of NGOs and those experience of running projects in the territories, which again has been another challenge. And so decisions have tended to move away from the priorities agreed uh, with the conservation based on the territories. Um, are moving more towards those persons not directly involved, usually sitting in the UK. And they've also tended to favour the UK government's own agencies, which previously didn't apply to these funds, so and for obvious reasons in terms of their cutting their budgets as well. Obviously, the help of those agencies is welcome, but not if it's actually competing with the local bodies. So, looking at some of the successes which have occurred over this period, so you can be instructed too. All inhabited territories, except two with very, very small populations, where these have populations affected the NGO, they now function in conservation NGOs and all have government conservation departments, and some of which, in both categories, we have developed. We were also initially successful in working with our French and, and Dutch opposite landlords um, to get the European Parliament and Commission to start the, the proposals to provide some grants of their other headings, but also to start the best grant program. Um, and, and that greatly increased conservation. Uh, then the lobby, the much larger life fund, which is the written that you can access already, might be available to uh, the territories. But obviously, none of these will be available if and when UK leaves the European Union. Our uh, 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 lobbying by ourselves and others um, did help keep the UK government grant schemes on several occasions when they were absolutely about to cancel them, uh, and as well as a small project, which we've been very well before, they also help fund the large projects. One obvious one is the recent South Georgia successful uh, uh, ecological restoration. Right. We, should, we shouldn't say we couldn't put, call them by their methods, which are three things. The purpose is restoration. 
And also collaborative projects are usually increased. Usually increased. Uh, and many of those are not known. I'm sure you can just help help in facilitating leakages between my conference and work groups, etc. And, and obviously, our meetings here in the IEM are one example of this sort of communication and exchange and tool. Uh, and also, the, the, the territories, the territories have environment charters. I know that the, the environment is don't, uh, but uh, we provide a monitoring service of both in fulfilling international commitments, uh, which is what the charters actually sign this off. Now, there's a lot still to do. Um, and in many cases, the consultation needs an approach to address them. We've worked out, we've heard of many of them in this, in this conference. But the shortage of funding remains a dominant feature of preventing implementation of as many as desirable. Um, it's well known, we worked out 15 years ago, I think it's not changed since, that funding by UK government uh, in the conservation of overseas territories, on which most of the global water biodiversity, which UK is responsible, uh, lives, is several orders of magnitude less for endemic species, or indeed almost any other measure you choose to use, uh, than the rest of the UK. And although there have been issues to increase this, the decision on priorities have been based on popularity in the UK rather than analyses in the territories. For example, uh, endemic species and key ecosystems tend not to be included in the areas covered. And also, the long term projects which need to be speech and ecosystem recovery and capacity are far less favoured by the UK government funding rules and practice than short term projects by those who are not pleased to engage in the region. NGOs, of course, tend to be very cost effective, partly because they're deploying lots of volunteer effort, but grants have been moving towards more expensive organisations. Um, but much of the cross coordination work, which recent programs have been with, on which the government often calls for information, uh, is incredibly difficult to fund because there are no immediate outputs. The outputs are facilitating the actual conservation efforts, which is our problem. Um, so we need, need a, uh, the UK government to be much more aware of NGO effort and pay tribute and ideally some funding to it. Um, but important NGO services in danger, incredibly. Earlier this year, our capital and our chairman has some links to uh, close down because of lack of finances. And that's a staggering because it's high level of, of, of support it can be. So we know that these sort of services are at risk of a similar fate to because of, the, of this lack of support for those things. We submitted recently extensive evidence to the current review by UK government with uh, future funding of UK overseas territory conservation. I know that one or two CDs might like to be included in that list too, others wouldn't. Um, but the size of the problem does by the surprise of the officials uh, the number of submissions. This isn't the criticism of the officials. These poor guys and girls keep being changed in wrong. Uh, so they're running to catch up. So I admire them for starting the, the, the inquiry, um, but obviously they will be learning uh, um, to go to. Um, with the changes in, 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 in ministers, a pretty chaotic state of UK government at present. We are the outcome with some trepidation because we don't know how seriously that's going to be taken. So, in this context, we've been striving to find other resources for territory conservation. We very much welcome all this current leadership attempting to build up on efforts to set up cross territory fund, including uh, contributions from various sources. So, um, that's probably um, what I want to say. I think I've actually stayed just about in time. Uh, and and it's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the time to share my things. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much. And, and I'm sorry I have a density of that, but I'm, I'm sure that my, um, my colleagues from the charities will be able to give you a much more polished view given one at a time. Thank you very much. And Natural History Society. Hello. <laughs> um, okay, well, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank Roland and his team for having me over, and uh, I hope I make it worth your while. Uh, okay, so, so the, the question posed by this session is uh, what role should NGOs and government play in response to climate change and biodiversity loss across islands? And I think the, 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 the talk I've put together is, is actually about what... Uh, what uh, role NGOs and governments can play rather than should play, but I'll qualify that by saying that if we can, then we should. Um, I'm going to use Gibraltar as an example because that's where I'm from and it's where I work. 
Um, most of these principles should apply across islands and territories, but it is important to note that we all differ in our, in our capacities. Okay, so a second qualifier, because we're talking about islands, but this is Gibraltar, and Gibraltar is certainly not an island. It's a peninsula. But it's certainly an island politically, and I think we could argue that it's, it's definitely an island ecologically as well. It's surrounded by all of that is Spain, and that's the world. So a few facts about the, uh, the Gibraltar government. Um, I would say that, uh, well, first of all, the, the very obvious point that uh, a, a healthy society needs a strong and active government and, uh, and also strong and active NGOs. Gibraltar has what I would, what I would describe as, as big government. It's a very well-resourced uh, government with a large public sector. Um, I think it's fair to say that government has a, has a fair influence in our daily lives in, in Gibraltar. We're not a mini Soviet Union or anything like that, but I think that, that that's fair to say. Um, and, and I think that that should place an obligation upon the government to, to act in terms of these uh, in terms of these issues. But uh, but then governments are governments and uh, and politicians are politicians. Hands up with your politicians. <laughs> well, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, so for example, we've got about uh, about five thousand. Is that right, leaders and civil servants? Um, that's about eighteen percent of the total working population of Gibraltar, but about twenty-eight percent of the local of the Gibraltarian working population. Because one of the advantages of not being an island is that about 10,000 people cross the border into Gibraltar to work every day. And then there are many more employees of, uh, of companies that are contracted um, entirely or almost entirely to support government services. So as I say, government is very good. We also have a number of uh, environmental NGOs. So the, the top top left there is, is the NGO that I represent, but we also have others such as, uh, you can see the Environmental Safety Group, the Nautilus Project, Sustainable Gibraltar, and also other in, uh, NGOs too, which might not be strictly environmental, but do support environmental campaigns, such as the Gibraltar Heritage Trust. And a really important point to make here is that, um, that all of these NGOs, um, to a certain extent, focus on, on different areas of the environment, and, uh, and we tend to, uh, to support each other's work and uh, come together when necessary. So there's no jealousy or competition or, or anything like that, or so perhaps very little of it. <laughs> but the important point of that unity is strength, and I think it's really important when, when, when dealing with crucial issues for, for society to see different groups coming together to campaign. But as I say, the public responds better, I think, when there are multiple organisations involved in issues. However, governments, especially strong governments, are endowed with attributes that NGOs can never have. Um, for example, um, only governments have the power to legislate, very important point, given that uh, legal instruments are crucial in, in times of crisis, such as the climate crisis that we're currently facing. And only governments can make substance, uh, substantive <coughs> infrastructural changes, for example, in response to, to climate change, sea level rise, things like that. The attitude of a government can impact work on halting biodiversity loss and climate change significantly. So it makes a real difference, definitely in a place like Gibraltar, whether a government is proactive or reactive or even inactive. Um, we've seen that uh, a lot of people are employed by, by the government and, and those, uh, those attitudes uh, can quickly spread through a very sizable proportion of the population. 
NGOs, of course, can pressure governments, but uh, this depends very much on government receptiveness, and it can occasionally feel like you're banging your head against a brick wall. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to say that that's not the case at the moment in Gibraltar, but partly because somebody was tired of banging his head against a brick wall and would come to that. <laughs> and I think a really important point is that the committed government should work as hard as they possibly can for rapid change whilst in office. If you make effective change, it can be really difficult to reverse, even if a future gov government doesn't have the same attitude as the government of the day. So governments really have to put the work in whilst they're in office. Also, I think that government action gives a community-wide focus and, and fosters less of a, an, a, a sort of a us versus them feel. And I think this is an important point as well because there will always be a certain part of society that views the environmental movement with a certain level of suspicion. So, sort of the woolly jumper brigade of lefties. But, uh, but I think, I think that uh, I think well, at least it gives them the assurance that that the establishment is is behind it as well. NGOs should, of course, give governments their full support. Should support the work of when they don't. That's a, that there's a, a number of NGOs marching for the recent climate strikes. Public engagement is crucial. Um, public understanding, really important. I think even more important nowadays than, than uh, we had assumed given this, this sort of uh, regression by, by certain sectors of, of society when it comes to, to um, facts and, and science and so forth. So it's increasingly important to keep ideas about the importance of the environment and about science mainstream. And uh, I think that both NGOs and governments should be, uh, should be taking a lead in this. A difficulty potentially in small, in small territories is that uh, Trees there because I think that it's a lot easier to convince people in small territories that their wildlife is important when we talk about special flora, fauna, or endemic species. It's it's a lot harder to persuade them that we can really make a difference when it, when it comes to climate change. And in a sense, they're right. I mean, the the the, the facts that was that we're faced with is that uh, we in small territories can do everything right and make zero difference on a global scale. And conversely, we can misbehave but benefit from virtuous uh, larger nations. So if anyone knows a convincing argument in favor of acting on climate matters beyond the obvious sort of moral obligation or the prestige that is attached to be, uh, from being uh, seen to be acting correctly, then please tell me about it, because I'll be very interested in it. I brought, that, I brought up this image of the partridge. That is the Barbary partridge. Uh, Gibraltar is the only place in mainland Europe where it's found. And it's sort of unofficially considered our national bird, but it's introduced. The importance of joining NGOs and working with international NGOs does uh, this, uh, this gives, gives, gives a global perspective to local actions, and it illustrates the, the global impact of local action. So a few of the, the different NGOs that we're associated in some way, um, uh, my Gibraltar Natural History Society, so the UK Overseas Territories Conservation Forum, we're a full partner of BirdLife International, partner of the IUCN. We carry out bird ringing under the auspices of, of British Cross for Ornithology, members of BatLife Europe. So this is all important. It's important for people in our small communities to see that we're part of the bigger picture. Also really important to take part in global movements. Um, this is uh, all of the Gibraltar environmental NGOs coming together recently to, um, to march um, to support the, uh, the climate strikes. And engagement of the media, absolutely crucial. Engagement of local media. That's, that's me there carrying the banner in there in a sort of a high-vis vest, and, uh, and I have to say that I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a, 
a reluctant activist, so I don't like marching and all that sort of thing, but it's going to be done. Okay. Be the catalysts of change in adults. I think that uh, it's uh, it's really, really welcoming and, and, and surprising to see how mature children can be when it comes to these issues. And if that fails, then they can nag like hell as well. <clears throat> so they're the future. Governments obviously can play a crucial role with children and uh, school activities and so forth. <clears throat> NGOs as well can educate and involve the youth in grassroots campaigns. And I think that, uh, that apart from the importance of introducing the youth to environmental campaigns, it's also use, a useful introduction to, um, to activism and social issues in general in a non-partisan, non-political way. So a few examples of education, we have a, a Raptor rehabilitation uh, units in, in our society and, and they visit schools every year and, and the birds of prey are, are really popular. And this is another another NGO, the, the Nautilus Project, which focuses on marine issues. They're doing a lot of really good education work and uh, I think it's fair to say that they're, that they're um, pushing the agenda on marine issues and, and on plastic pollution and stuff like that. And, and really keeping the government on its toes, even though the government is very active. <clears throat> We've been talking about politics versus NGOs, or politics and NGOs as, as, as if they're two sort of mutually exclusive things, but uh, are they really? I mean, what if, what if, um, oh, there's a sort of prominent politician who's going to be popular, it should say prominent environmentalist politicians. Um, so that is uh, John Gorges, who used to be the, the used to chair our Natural History um, <coughs> Society. He was tired of banging his head against the wall, decided to run for office, and um, on a slate of, of, uh, three, of, of 30 candidates, he came second in 2011. He's been the Environment Minister ever since, and, and uh, although I think that people who aren't used to politics quickly realize that politics is for politicians. Um, they can affect a lot of change, nevertheless. As an example, since, since 2012, Minister Cortez has, has enacted 180 <laughs> items of environmental legislation, including a 39 expansion of the nature reserve to include now almost all terrestrial habitats in Gibraltar. And that's really quite a thing to say in a place that is smaller than Albany and has a population of 33,000 people. A new marine reserve as well, um, marine regulations. Passed the climate emergency motion in Parliament that was, that was uh, supported by everyone in Parliament. Growth of the Department for the Environment from, from 20 staff in 2011 to 180 staff now with a doubling of scientific officers and that department is ably led by Lethal down there. <clears throat> but of course there are pitfalls too. Once you become a politician your subsequent participation in NGO activity is jeopardized because people will uh, obviously feel that you're politically biased. An important point too for NGOs is that when a government is very active and very positive in environmental terms, it's important that NGOs should ensure that their resolve, capacity and public profiles aren't weakened. In other words, we mustn't become complacent just because there is one of us in office. So NGOs need to remain strong, active and impartial. And even friends need to be kept in check sometimes. And in any case, they're not going to be in office forever. Whoops. 
Also, I think a really important point, going back to this whole issue of big governments in Gibraltar, is that in a, in a place where people can expect too much from governments, NGOs should also encourage personal responsibility. I think that's a really important point. So in summary, governments and NGOs have important roles to play. Governments can make legislative and infrastructural change. They can also make issues mainstream. NGOs can mobilize people from all, from all parties and persuasions. They can also come together, coalesce, try to set the agenda. They're crucial watchdogs too. And obviously, education is key. And environmentalists can enter politics, but NGOs must remain independent of party politics. Really important point. And I thought I'd finish with a gratuitous slide showing our <laughs> famous barbary <laughs> macaques. So there you go. But I'd like to make one more point because um, the the during during the, um, the the presentations on on scallops, the the, the point was made that uh, that identity uh, can be really important, <laughs> strong and important in small communities. I think that is a really important point in communities such as ours. I think that a lot of the problems that we're seeing in the world, in the Western world right now, are partly due to a breakdown or erosion of, of identity, or at least of, of, of the way that different parts of the population um, identify themselves. And identity is certainly really strong in Gibraltar. I know it is in your other ter territories. We frequently harness this for um, conservation purposes. And I think we need to do that, and we need to do it well. Okay, thank you. But you look like the homeboy, man. You. <laughs> <laughs> That's a stage of you, sir. Good afternoon. It's always a delight to be uh, talking at the uh, Island meetings. Um, when Roland phoned me up and asked me if I'd speak, I said, of course, I'd be absolutely delighted if I can do to make these meetings a success. Um, and I put the phone down and thought, well, what am I going to talk about? <laughs> climate change. So I thought, well, I can talk about government, Jersey, fantastic work that we do, nature conservation. I've got a brilliant team. My colleagues look after the marine side of things. We do fantastic water protection. We deal with pollution, um, a huge amount of work going on. And of course, the NGOs in Jersey, stunning, absolutely stunning. We've got people coming after the facts, we've got people doing research. It's, it's absolutely incredible the amount of time and effort that people give to. And I thought, well, that's what we have to be talking about. I'll be talking to you guys who are doing this day in and day out. And as it turns out, I've been keen. Uh, Made amazing presentation. I've just been really repeating what uh, uh, Chipotle is obviously doing so well. And I thought oh, I'll just I'll pop out and I'll play the uh, uh, Greta Thunberg presentation to uh, <laughs> the New York Convention. <laughs> so I thought, well, what I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about government policy in Germany, but um, this is more of a take really on um, my view of climate change and, and what I think needs to be done, really. Um, so when I was at school, we learned about climate change. Remember, we learned about general studies, we learned about um, you know, the late starter, it was in the late 20s when I went to university, and um, we studied botany, learned about carbon dioxide levels, problems that was going to cause, and that was over 20 years ago. Learn the refrain when we were young, um, think global, act local. You know, the hippie days of the 1970s, it was great. Couldn't be more pertinent today, really, in the world back then, I think. And whilst a great deal has happened since then, we're still now emitting more CO2 than we've ever done at any point in history. Now, the recent climate action summit in New, in New York has seen some great commitments. I think it's been a really, really good Paris agreement some years ago. Was so but governments and uh, big business have made some really good declarations now in New York. So I think we're hoping to make some progress. But at the same time, we've seen massive fires in the Amazon, 
if it was worried about uh, forest loss. And of course, places like Brazil would be pulling the burden of that forest. Of course, why are they burning their forests? Who's buying the tin? One big burgers that are clearing the forest to trade glasses. Well, of course, probably thousands of years ago. So we've got different resources to exploit now. I think some of these other countries around the world are exploiting their resources the same way that we've done in the past. And what's government going to do? Well, government's concerned with government's concerned with economic security. I want my lights to come on. I like hot water, my shower in the morning. And would I vote for somebody who promised me? Less power, fewer goods and services, and a lower standard of living. Let's how do we sell that to people? People are motivated, a lot of people are motivated by money, and that's the rich and the poor. And it's a really hard sell to ask people to reduce their standard of living. So it is a huge problem. And what drives climate change and biodiversity crisis? Well, I think it's the economy, basically. It's the human element we need to be concerned about. Extinction events, well, if it wasn't for extinction events, we wouldn't be here. And it's the human extinction events which the economy really is driving. I think we need to protect the wild and create more wild. We need to manage it well. And us humans, we're the only ones that can be our saviors. The world will carry on without us. Quite regardless, and in a million years' time, we won't even know that we were here. So, it's very difficult to change government direction without significant impact, input from the public, and that's us as individuals, as well as the NGOs. Um, we are the NGOs, we are the public, we are the government, essentially. Money is such a powerful, powerful driver. Um, you know, figures up here. When I was young, we used to talk about things in millions. Billion was a word that kind of like a word we use zillion for. It was a made up word. Trillion. You never heard the word trillion 30 years ago. Now we're talking about trillions all the time. Had a, a, a quick look on, uh, on Google. Not Google, I don't use Google. I had a look on a nice Search engine and um, 2017 figures uh, 75 to 87 and a half trillion dollars is what the oil industry is worth at the moment. Who's going to give up? The, these companies, we're asking them to give up over 75 trillion dollars worth of income every year. So we really need to do something about the economy to change that drive. Um, Who's the biggest oil producer in the world? I don't think we answer this. It's the USA. So, I think it's very difficult for us in small island communities because we don't have the international presence of large countries or even the international businesses which drive the economy in this area. We don't have big trading blocks. So we've got a very limited ability to influence international processes. We can join together. Um, I think we've got a, 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 a bigger voice, but even so, population wise, all the islands in the world are small islands in the world together, yeah, but there's still a, a real drop in the ocean. We think I need to operate in a different way by providing a demonstration of good practice. Now, like Keith says, what can we do? Can we make a little difference as a small island? Well, I think we can by influencing what other people do. We can influence bigger governments. Um, one of the big problems, I think, is carbon budgeting at the moment is really take into account the footprints of goods and materials. In Jersey, of course, we import almost everything that we use, but we only budget the carbon that we produce in the island itself. It's therefore imperative, I think, that we as individuals, consumers, governments, NGOs, corporate organisations, everybody acts to reduce their own personal carbon footprints. And try to influence others by demonstrating good practice and by pressuring them to be right on it. Um, so in Jersey, the states have declared a uh, climate emergency, and that's absolutely amazing. Okay? Um, 
In Jersey, we're proposing to do a whole range of uh, mitigation, adaptation, and sequestration activities. So we're developing policy at the moment, which hopefully will be coming <laughs> later this year. Uh, we're producing a sustainable transport policy, and hopefully a lot of that will be based around public transport rather than electric cars. It's very difficult to get to Simcoe at the moment and have vehicles, electric cars. We also need to mine more rare earth metals and produce them. Um, we're going to implement our energy plan. We're very lucky in Jersey. We uh, have low carbon electricity. We import from far. Um, I talked yesterday about the Jersey Island Plan, a fantastic policy document. It's so powerful. It controls how our land is used, it controls where we build houses, it controls how people are housed. Um, it creates bylaws, it creates building standards, really good for society. We work with Jersey Overseas Aid. We, uh, Jersey is an island, we commit a significant amount of money to Overseas Aid. And we're working with them, they've already got the contacts in the countries. Uh, we're going to do big uh, reforestation projects, really. Um, we're seeking partnerships. Jersey and Guernsey traditionally have been uh, at odds since the Civil War. Jersey were the royalists, and Guernsey uh, they were the, uh, the opponents. <laughs> uh, we've really forgiven ourselves, we've yeah, forgiven each other since then. Um, but we're now, now working together, and um, hopefully that will increase as the years go by. Um, Jersey's trying to create a carbon neutral strategy. Um, we've got a shoreline management plan, uh, obviously, the Channel Islands. As you can see around Albany, the, um, the Nazis occupied the Channel Islands during the Second World War. In Jersey, they left us some fantastic sea defences. Uh, they've got these anti tank walls, but now we've got a, a really good sea defence resource. Um, £5 million pounds worth of money will be provided through raised fuel duty and other new money. Um, but again, as individuals, we need to be writing to our favourite companies for foods and services that we produce and to try and put some pressure on them. My favourite solution, past solution, is, is not to do any ironing. Last time I had a shirt was about four years ago. <laughs> Went to my niece's wedding and I knew I'd support my mother if I didn't buy my shirt. Um, just to sum up then, um, I think all we can do is act quickly and drastically to reduce our impact. It's unlikely that we'll limit warming to Earth one and a half degrees. Uh, certainly with our current response, but we all need to take small and large steps and convince everybody else to do the same. So, what can we do about climate change? We can reduce, reuse, recycle, create circular economies, build end of life into our designs, we need to educate, we need to alleviate poverty, we need to transition our economy from growth to a sustainable model. Um, carry on with all this excellent and inspiring work that we've been hearing about over the last few days, and read the ingredients on your plastic biscuit packet and complain to somebody about what's in there. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> well, we're very pleased and very honoured to have the Honourable Claude Holden here today, Honourable Minister, Ministry of Agriculture, Trade, Land, Housing and the Environment. That's quite a big joke, right? Yes, it's too much. For months, right? It's too much. Yes. Thank you. I want to do the ministry. Yeah, I made a mistake. I think it was a politician of mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I just talked till 6 o'clock. Anyway, I just have borders. As <laughs> um, I've been to Albany three times, once mentally, twice physically. First time was uh, mentally I met um, the folks from Albany, Roland, and others in Jibaba for the first time, when we had the first council of ministers meeting, I think, three years ago. Four, I'm getting old. <laughs> and uh, I think they allowed me to summarize as, as, as I am today. And I made such a big mess of the whole thing, um, telling the British that they need to pay attention to the overseas territories and uh, we, we can't be going on volunteer money it's from NGOs, we need a specific budget. But things have improved, so I won't say anything bad about the British today. 
<laughs> but uh, what I shall do is uh, provide a summary of what I've learned over the last uh, four years and what we have been talking about uh, uh, today. The first time I was in Albany, of course, um, we went through a lot of some of what we're going to know. And I think this time we have actually come a long way. And you might recognize that during this week, we actually we have actually discussed all of these things. Geological activity, water and environment, flora and fauna, life and habitat, response across our islands, and last week we were talking about NGO government in the context of climate change and biodiversity. And like a true politician, all of these will come in my presentation, but not in any necessary order. <laughs> so, here we go. This is Montserrat, just to tell you where I'm from. And that's like a depiction of the, of what is remaining as the Sufria. We had a great big volcanic eruption, which has been continuing for a while. Destroyed two thirds of the island, displaced about uh, uh, the two thirds of the population. We have about uh, 20,000 new citizens in England. They were finally rounded up from across the Caribbean and in the United States where they ran away to. Um, but they were eventually uh, deported or, and, and, and had to seek refuge in England. Because you know, British have a policy that they allow you to run to whichever corner of the world first. Before you take it back. <laughs> uh, so, just in summary, we have been talking about oceans, rivers, lakes, springs which are some of the ecosystems that we need uh, to foster life and our habitats for ourselves. Um, we have cut down a lot of trees to do that, the houses, etc. Um, we have continued to enjoy our flora, fauna, sea life. And this is uh, what we have come to, which is a, a, a perception. This is not based on science. It's a perception of what is happening with geological activity declining. I'm optimistic in the more um, explosion in Montreal. But rivers have become less. Most of them have been destroyed, at least in Montreal. We're getting news around the world. We have a decline in lakes, decline in springs. We have a project to actually um, we resuscitate our center hills, and I think we have technicians here who serve the Montreal to do that. So we have a water catchment area. Weather systems are increasing. Talking about hurricanes, we've had several people <coughs> up to Burma, etc. But fauna decreasing, and Earth space is basically declining. At least two thirds of it has been lost under volcanic rock and debris in Montserrat and increasing what we call it climate change. All sorts of weird things are happening. It's raining when sun is shining, rainbow when there's no rain. <laughs> it's a great, great thing. So what's our NGO and government response? It is, in my view, equal to a human response. I, I'm, I'm an optimist and I take a systemic approach to politicians, not a realistic one. Uh, I, I, I kind of use politicians, including myself, to make things happen. And I think that our response together, NGOs and government, is human because we love nature and also we have respect for other life forms. I've listened to everybody. I've listened to, to you talk about you know, rescuing um, birds by actually going through the trouble of capturing them, holding them in captivity. These are enormous things we're doing to save other life forms. Why are we doing that? Because we love our own life. We're preserving the earth for selfish reasons as well. Because if you don't do it, maybe your turn will come. 
and we're just doing our best as humans, love nature, respect, and preserve our own life. So what can government respond, what our response would be? Should it be more versus less intervention of government? Why is this question arising? It is because in the British system, they went to parliament to democracy, which they want less of now. <laughs> we have inherited a situation where the NGOs have been at the forefront of doing what I said before, loving nature. Government service as something we did as a hobby until we started to have the science on the 2% rise in sea level, the climate change issues. Then we're now looking for governments to do more, but they were never organized to do more. The tax bases were never invented or, or constructed to take account of this really major cost of repairing the environment. So now we need the government to do more. We need government to make policy, <coughs> pass legislation, and create public goods which will help us to foster saving, conserving, preserving the environment. That's what we need from government now. And that has to be coordinated at the national level. Why? Because somebody said it before because that is how all systems work. But for the environment, it has been working opposite. Governments have been behind. And I think Dr. Ken probably feels that they're still behind in terms of providing resources. But governments have had budgets for education, health, community service, welfare at the forefront of their minds. And we are still fighting to restructure this approach to include, not separately, and this is, this is my advice, not separately an idea of biodiversity or climate change. I think what we need to do is to create a cross-cutting theme where biodiversity, climate change issues are captured in the existing budget lines. So whatever you do, try to make it fit into provision of education, um, promoting better health, providing community services, or creating opportunities for welfare. Because it's very difficult to invent and convince politicians and the electorate that there is something called climate change by itself. You know, it will take us another 100 years and you know how politicians are, as I say, and people are. The roof will have to fall on our heads before we see climate change. And of course, there are also denials, which makes it even worse. And people, most of the people, not like you here, very well informed about what is going on. Most of them are so into their daily lives. I'm a politician, I can tell you that they have no time to think about how many cats are killed this week. Unfortunately, this is the world in which we live here. 70 odd percent of the people of the world, or in my world, struggling to make ends meet, struggling to send their children to school. And when I invite them to meetings that I have with some of, my, some of you have been to Montreal, they see it as entertainment and not as serious as how we have it. When it becomes meaningful to them is when we start to tell them it's going to elevate their life in ways that they can relate to. And these ways have been historically documented and practiced. So NGOs, that's one thing you need to do. Two, your funding strategies need to take account of the public, private, high net worth, individual smart. We have had, we have had, we have in the Caribbean, for example, Richard Branson, but 
We know what those avenues are. The problem we have is mobilizing these resources which we can in different ways, but we have to mobilize them around what I think are priorities. And this is this has been coming up, I think, this week. What are the priorities that we want public monies, private monies, or high net worth monies to be targeted towards? And I think, as I said, education and so on will come into the picture. But if you if we are going to believe from here as a force for good, this group, I think we need to look at the domestic level. What are those things that we can do best at the domestic level? And then we need to look at those things that we can do best together. I think one of the models that you'll find in terms of implementation is practiced by RSPB, where they'll have a project, multi island, where they basically replicate some of the activities and the deployment of resources. So, when I say group, I mean we must identify an activity or a series of activities or a particular project that has, that can cut across several islands and utilize a chain of experts in different areas of expertise. So, our signing a channel today, I think, is a step in the right direction. I think when we flesh out that charter, we should come up with what are the things in that charter that we're going to call, call the cross country issues that all of us will buy into and all of us will lobby for financing for from these different categories of funding lines, separate to and perhaps complementary to what we're doing at the domestic level. <clears throat> but there's going to be something we can do at the domestic level where you'll find small pockets of money from high net worth individuals or private uh, fundraising or crowdfunding, which are only sufficient to deal at the national the domestic level. So you have to get very sophisticated about it and not be everywhere. And it's like being a political party. The group things are really, once you agree group things, we get into an area we call collective responsibility. That no matter what else is going on, everybody else or well, everybody should be making sure that we try to attain the group result that we have agreed to in this General Assembly. So there are going to be opportunities, which brings me to one of the points um, Dr. Payne's council was making. We're going to have opportunities where large NGOs as in the past, we seek to compete against our national agendas because it might be an opportunity just to do something which is not even aligning with what we want to do in that country. I can tell you, for example, we have had interventions from NGOs doing um, calling, we had some problems with lots of wildlife left in the exclusion zone and they were culling um, goats and cattle and lots of wild animals to suppress the ambiental tick which was multiplying and entering into the habitat area of Montserrat. And then they just up and abandoned that because there were other bigger money making opportunity things to be done elsewhere. Some in Montreal and in other territories. So we have to stick together in establishing our national agenda, which are the domestic issues as well, and not allow ourselves to be manipulated by opportunistic behavior. And having group, agreed group projects should help us to focus. Because the NGOs are very important and powerful in providing capacity, the science, expertise, if not the, I mean, all the human resources to help us achieve our agenda. But we have to ensure 
that we as the recipients, the nation states, so to speak, we must lead and control the agenda. I think this point has been made by other persons here. And then, of course, this last point here, in what are we doing in education, health, community services, um, in designing our projects, we must include, and I think I heard it in some of the presentations, we must include the local people, the grassroots support, the fishers in trying to declare marine protected areas. They have signs of the sea that we're not aware of. And even if we don't want to be aware of it because we are so scientifically advanced, we have to show them the respect of incorporating their views into what we're implementing. Or else, that is when politicians get in trouble. And you think that we are the ones destroying the thing. No, it's the public driving us to destroy it because they feel excluded. So politicians are bad creatures, they just be vessels. <laughs> Sometimes. And in summary, therefore, I'm calling for us to have coordination at the political and technical level. We must do this more, or at least I like what we're doing. Where some politicians, many politicians are here, we're signing charters leading the way with policy agendas and reflecting what you are saying so that we can speak at the UN, we can speak at the various forum and have less of rural confusion. That's what that's why that's why we are interacting with you to learn what to say, what not to say, where we are, how we're going. So rural confusion ends up on the international stage when NGOs, experts are saying a different thing to the politicians. And now you know because the NGOs are ahead in the game of the environment, you have two stages to exploit the global stage. NGOs are very established organizations. You have ocean governance, committees and panels. You don't even need politicians on some of these international stages because the whole world is galvanized towards saving the planet. But you must take advantage that you have two, two ways to exploit the international stage. One, through your expert panels and your UN forum meetings, but you also have the politicians who are also needed to represent at the political level. And so it's good that they interact with you, it's good you feel and exchange views so we are all on the same page, basically. And on the financing strategies, and the way forward into battle here, I'm going back to what I said before, that we can't rely on the tax and spending model for financing saving the earth. I don't think we could tax people enough to finance the kind of thing we're trying to finance. I think, as I said in a different forum, we have to look at the pollute to pay principle, try to work with the governments in terms of legislation, in terms of mechanisms for collecting from the polluter or the consumer who is using the product some mechanism where when people are buying or exchanging or using products, and they do that very well in England, that some of those funds are captured and recycled into some of the programs that you do. So we need the NGOs, the experts, the scientists to actually inform us on where we see opportunities to capture resources that could work directly and add to the resources that we have for tax and spend, add to the budgets for education, health and welfare. We might borrow a little bit, but we won't take it all because you know everybody has to pay a dividend to the society. Right? So that's what I think. 
And then, in conclusion, please, go back around. They're going to sing from the same hymn sheet. Because whatever we devise in relation to the pull the place principle, I mean, some economists to help us work on that part. And if we attach those to the ideas that we are generating here, the projects that we are running, and we're saying the same things on the international stage, we're on the same team sheet, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have a success story. Thank you. Switched off from the base, sorry. Uh, now they all want to switch. And Gabriel had the microphone, wasn't switched on. <laughs> anyway, whatever, I'll shout. Um, I'm just, it's a question of uh, theory. Have you have, have any of the panel come across a quite big framework called Donuts Economics? And it's reworking of the entire economics model updated for the 21st, 22nd century away from Keynesian economics where we operate within the, the sort of the carrying capacity both sociologically and environmentally and it, it's a way of capturing a whole new way of considering the economic construct away from the madness of never-ending exponential growth in a world of finite forces which Someone said, you either have to be a madman or, or an economist to believe in. So, have you heard of it? If you haven't, I recommend you read it. It's an amazing read. It's very helpful. Can I answer those? I haven't, so I'll leave it to the rest. I think it's a, I'm not an economist, but I wish I'd studied economy when I was a senior now because I think it's so important to study how to That this is one of the few economy books I've read. I've found it incredible to think about how this really. It's the obvious way forward as far as I can see. So it's a person called Kate Rayner. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to cross her but she'd be a very good speaker to get along to some of the She's a very good person. Well, I've heard of it, but I think only one of the panel was trained as an economist, haven't they? Yes. Yes, I'm a person who's trying to just break it down rather um, simpler. But yes, uh, but I don't think the world is going to change very quickly in that direction in, in, in a few hundred years behind. So in the meantime, we can transition. We can transition by using you know, devices that are that that are excellent. Thank you, Robert. Um, I suppose it was that. Yeah, on the wall here. Yeah. It's right, Tom. John, 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 whether they think the public in it, in all of their support for the work or uh, trying to save that planet, is actually ready to pay for it. Do you think that we are going to be successful in bringing in those blue to pay measures and all those very significant charges? And I raise that in the context of Jersey's number one problem, which is 
people's love affair with the car, which is yeah. just seems to be Jersey and Drake for a See how that's it kind of views on it. I'll be talking about traffic specifically because that is a real burning issue in Gibraltar as well. And uh, people to 200 meters to the super and things like that. So I don't think you can, I, I think it's extremely difficult to persuade people to change. I think that uh, the governments have to lead legislation, taxation, but uh, I think it's extremely difficult to change those attitudes. And I think they're very slow to change. I, mean, I, I do remember being a child, it's quite a long time ago. Um, but then the idea that parents would drive their children to schools was actually unthinkable. Uh, yeah, and uh, whereas now it's almost a thing what you know, you're always getting accused of child neglect if you don't. Um, so I, I think that, that takes time. It takes time to go the way too, and, and obviously social pressures um, do adjust and you know, that also requires investment, for example, in the best public transport for these things to happen. That, that can't follow, it has to be there first. So there are difficulties in that regard, I think. Yeah, I, I actually think that it's a combination. It will, it will happen at the combination of both. People are getting more sophisticated about the environment and the way they live. And I think that um, they can be, they can be molded to the situation. I personally do not believe in, in um, legislation which is uh, either carrot or, or stick. But I think you can you can make legislation that uh, incentivizes people to move in a particular direction. Um, and I think it will happen. But it's happening already in some communities. Um, the, the most sophisticated communities are. Look, for example, at, at um, how people are cooperating even in the islands with sorting their refuse. You, you, could, you wouldn't believe that they would do it. But people are putting plastics and papers and are into recycling. And I think that, that they are also concerned about carbon and I think they would want less cars in the world. And you just have to give them a reason to, to make the change. I, I heard that um, something like 40% of the total world economy is maybe somehow also allied with that. I know, I think that's impossible to believe that, but you know, that, that's everything of those oil and petrol and the whole thing. It, it's, it seems amazing that an invention is only you know, 120 years old or something, you know, you know, has become so ubiquitous, and that our health is declining because we don't get enough exercise. And we were crazy people. Um, I can tell you an example in, in Montreal, for example, we just introduced um, zero tariff on the import of electric vehicles. And uh, on hybrids, we pay maybe a service charge to deal with recycling batteries. And that incentive, you now people are switching from using um, gasoline vehicles to ordering um, the, the alternative. And I, I was surprised at the take up of that. And, and it's an incentive because uh, gasoline vehicles are taking is a tax level of about 70% um, to import one um, in between tariff and concerns on charges and poor charges. So they're, they're delighted to switch and that is going to the environment. So you can try that in um, Jersey if you can afford the uh, can afford the last year of your course. You can do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Ground, you can have an agricultural vehicle, so now everybody drives down in taxis. Yes, a question at the back of the box. Thank you, thanks, man. Stay welcome. It's only a day in the book, and someone from the economics background, hopefully not a man, but 
<laughs> Need a judge? <laughs> but if we actually pay for the whole life costs of certain things, and I think in particular in plastics, we actually did pay for the whole life costs. These things would be wildly much more expensive than they are now. And that would be one hell of an incentive not to use them. Uh, so, panel's view is on introducing taxes, as it were, which actually cover the whole life cost of using these and putting that money to good purpose <coughs> our fight against uh, environmental regulation. Thank you. But my, my view is <coughs> it's only taxation that is going to resolve the, the problems we've got. We, we need to properly value the things we produce and use. And until we do that, I, I, I think the subsidisation of the fossil fuel industry uh, in all its uses is, is going to continue destroying this planet and, and, until we change that process. I think the taxation and uh, the proper valuing is the same. I think uh, the, the point that you Assessing these by their real cost, which essentially is what you're, you're saying, rather than the, the exploiting common value, which is such that what you do is, is an excellent idea. Whether or not politically that could ever be imposed, <laughs> you politicians are better doing it as an article. I think changes are happening, and there's, there's certainly been in the UK generating a enormous move away from that if people are becoming more aware of it and you can you can nudge people as much as you want but the value of a, a good piece of tv film where you actually see a seal or a green animal that has you know choked to death on a bag uh, i think that has a huge impact and people remember that and they think well you know every time i buy this you know this is going to be bad and i, I think it, i think it's We've now reached that point where people are asking shops, they're saying, I'm bringing my own bag, I'm not going to have this wrapped up, why do you have to wrap my pears? And I think people will just keep on with it. And we've all got to realise that we have an immense influence. You don't buy it, they won't make it. I, I, I was lucky enough to be in Japan for a couple of months ago, this year, and they certainly haven't heard about single use plastics. <laughs> they haven't heard about single use plastics. Oh, it's yeah. absolutely remarkable. So I think you're right in Europe, it, it's really forward thinking, but I think large parts of the world need a lot of catching up with. Um, yes, a question down here in the middle. Hello, um, I'm Lizzie Walker. Um, I think the thing with the blue planet, planet effect is quite interesting. I read a study the other day where someone analysed all the word counts in um, New Planet, um, I think it's Our Planet is the Netflix one, uh, and Our Planet the Netflix one actually showed about environmental issues far more than any of the BBC mm. Um and New Planet did rank very highly but only because the final episode was dedicated to environmental concerns. And the other part of the study was that it didn't actually focus on the human um, effects, which is why these conservation issues and environmental issues were a problem because of humans. Um, it was more just, oh yeah, this bad things are happening, we should care about it, but not actually explaining it for people but. Um, and do you think that more should be done to you know make people aware of what they're doing and actually I mean, you know, we were talking about our IP bags and Getting rid of plastic straws and stuff, but it all just seems quite surface level to me. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think really, I, I learned um, this, this one thing from EU law, which I like very much. You can do one law, so the proportionate in in in, in taking um, steps to curb people's behavior. I think it's going to be not a blanket uh, approach to publicity. But you're gonna to have to use obvious scenarios and incidents in life and put forward proportionate uh, solutions. It's, it's not that you're gonna have zero pollution in the world, but um, we, we should strive to to find a balance and to let people work themselves into uh, into into uh, 
you know, respect for the environment. I think it's going to be sustainable more in the longer term than to use a strictly uh, enforcement model. So I, I actually agree with you that. In everything we do on all of these uh, channels and everything that we're promoting, even if, if we're selling um, at danger to your health, similar to how we treat cigarettes. Uh, had we got time to allow it to happen gradually, the, the smoking ban happened, you know, bang, that was it, no more smoking. And, you know, folks complained about it, but it worked. People stopped smoking. They, they did what they were supposed to do, and the incidence of smoking has dropped. Is it not time that we actually say, no, enough is enough, this much we're going to ban? Blanket outright, you'll have to find something else. No more, no more single plastic use in public. Exactly. One of the things that we could do straight away. I, I think one that sort of thing would, as now is it seen in our publicity to make it feasible. But of course, remember the, the tobacco thing for 50 years. Uh, the fact that it's better to move it faster than that's on the uh, I think something. it's very important as well to let the companies that produce the goods we use know our views on and how they're producing what. You know, how they're producing goods and, and what they're actually producing. Because I think the power of the letter is, is you know, remarkably strong. For I also think because of the, you, you raise a point about about uh, educating people on on the impact that they're having, but but I actually think that certainly Western society, most of us are aware that we're having an impact, and and I think that that the really important point is how we trigger a change in behaviour. And I'll go back to the point that George made about the, the, the images of an animal dying. Because one thing that sort of we scientists struggle to understand sometimes is that a story, a narrative, matters a lot more to people than statistics. Mm -hmm. and, and it's getting the narrative right in order to trigger that change in behavior that people already know that they should be making that change. But how do you trigger that change? Yeah. I saw somebody, I thought over here was going to ask a question. No? Um, yes. <coughs> um, I probably can expect one of the things we talked about tipping points. So I think cycling in London is quite an interesting example. So I cycled in London when I was in my 20s, now 50. Now everyone wants to cycle, it's a slog good. Well, I want a good bike, you know. I cycle two miles, 10 miles to work. Something changed there, but we're talking about regulation or softly, softly. The, the mayors of London produced cycle lanes. They provided an incentive alongside the new policy. So what, in your areas like Gibraltar is interesting, where, how could it work in Gibraltar, Jersey small, everyone wants to use a car. Is there an opportunity to introduce cycle lanes? Is there an opportunity to introduce fishing areas for fishermen? You know, we need that. We need that sort of balanced in opportunity. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. And there's there's lots of opportunities. Um, we uh, my, my, my team manage a lot of public access in Jersey, for instance. And um, uh, the transport I mentioned earlier is being delivered by um, transport engineers. And I find it quite remarkable working with some of them because um, some of our sections of the Round Island footpath, for instance, is on road. And I'm trying to find ways to <coughs> create pedestrian refuges and safe walking routes. And I'm told by our traffic engineers that um, basically it will interfere with traffic flow. <laughs> uh, and people are better off walking on an unprotected road than if they put in traffic calming measures which could cause more accidents. Yeah. Um, and, and I think this is a real problem with cycle routes as well. Because Jersey's very small. You know, if you create inconveniences for the car driver, it might mean they're going to take two more minutes in their car on that journey. So create more one-way roads. You know, if there's not enough make it one there's lots of things yeah. that we could do, but we're just not being forward thinking enough at the moment. Just not happy. I, I think society's government still has a way to go before they can see the opportunity because, you know, it is about the car. A huge amount is still about the car. But this mindset that needs to change. An interesting fact in that regard about Gibraltar is that the buses are free. 
and everyone still drives. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think my, my view is there are more, there are more sort of complex sociological issues. Uh, um, yes. I, I think that because most of us live in small apartments, then the prestige that would be associated with owning a large house in the UK, for example, is transferred to the vehicles. So you want to be seen driving a really nice car. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just sorry, just to add a few points from Gibraltar. Um, our transport minister is super keen on bicycles and he feels that's the way forward and that's the only way forward. Um, so we do have some interesting debates sometimes. Having said that, I would honestly be afraid to let my children cycle in yeah. Gibraltar because yeah. the lanes are so small <coughs> and the drivers, we are so impatient. Heaven forbid we should take those two extra minutes to allow that poor cyclist to go off that little hill and we just overtake those things. Whilst in Gibraltar, we are introducing cycling wherever possible. And the new transport, the, the current transport meter is really putting them in everywhere. There's that extra change and that educational process, I feel, um, that, that sort of needs to come hand in hand. And the ability and not the ability, but we need to be brave <coughs> as governments to take unpopular decisions at the right time. Because if you take an unpopular decision at the right time and you strategize how to get there, you will have an amazing effect. I mean, we did in Gibraltar with the, um, the massive banning of public of balloons. Uh, you know, and the science administration came in and said, because they were in their first year, of the, you know, so they had three more years to get people to have their, to get used to the unpopular decision. So the first year after getting into, into office, they said, right, I'm taking these unpopular decisions now. Because with time, people adjust, they get used to it. It's not the biggest thing. You don't take unpopular decisions in the year before an election. Mm -hmm. So you can take them in a year just after an election. But I think, I think my bicycle would be the uh, electrical vehicle. <laughs> I think folks should look for something. It doesn't have to be bicycle, you can look for look for something that is gonna have a positive return for the environment. And uh, mine would be an electric vehicle or hybrid vehicle, provide an incentive for folks to switch into something positive. Uh, if it's not bicycle, it could be go karts that we know. And um, <laughs> free bus there, if you had it in one track, I'd definitely take people off the road because people like to be chauffeured that is uh, I think also, if you can combine the legislation, public information, health, it works. I think I was thinking to do with transport, but the change in attitude that public to bats and bitten, what, 30 years ago? Um, and there was a combination of the damaging bats are illegal, but a big NGO network was mobilized to advise people how to deal with their bat problems, including is it a big problem, and at the same time, other population. So, uh, the, Stronger packs can be wildly successful uh, if you get the time right. Too many people. That's the bottom line. Yes, William. Um, have you got a microphone? Yeah. No, I think I'll be all right. <laughs> well, then, Jen. Maybe in the nature of the way in which we are conditioned to live as humans, that the global economic model requires us to continually be producing and buying more. And we see that when there is a blip in that system, when China slows down, <coughs> the rest of the world suffers. And as a consequence of that, the problem seems to me is that we have to be able to persuade people that more is not better. Now, I've witnessed the growth of the middle class in India over the last 20 years, it is depressing and it is frightening because what they are saying is you were the model we wanted to emulate, we now have the economic resources to do it and guess what, all of a sudden you have 300 <coughs> million middle class people and they're all on that bandwagon and they all want those cars. Go to Mumbai, see the Rolls Royces, see the Mercedes, see the shopping carts, and this is the future of India, promoted by the government and China. And so, 
it is very easy to become despondent. So politicians will only act if their political careers are threatened. That's a reality. So I believe that we should be looking to raise individual consciousness in order that we can all <coughs> have to say, do you know what? What I have today is going to impact the life of somebody tomorrow. But do you know what? That is a really difficult. If politicians are driven by the interests of this, then they will go with big business. Point business becomes one and becomes so strong that that body can then direct to governments and can direct to business how the future is to unfold. But I think it's incumbent on all of us, easy enough for us middle class people. We can afford the premium on buying things which don't involve the use. But there's how many billion people out there yeah. struggling to get on that ladder. So as somebody who's studied yoga for 30 years, that's my recommendation. Develop a sense of personal responsibility and as Claude says, out of that comes the responsibility for others, and out of that comes respect for the planet and the humanity. And I think <coughs> depressing though the situation is, I firmly believe that is within our grasp, but we all have to work very hard on ourselves and look in that mirror every day and say, Do I really need all that? Yes, and 10% of the world has to be working. One more question. One more question. Last one. Last one. Yes. Sorry, we'll go all the way. I'm going to change. In picking up a couple of things, a couple of illustrations there. Um, obviously, I highlighted the love of people's cars, which is just the number one environmental issue. Um, I think what it points to is the need for integrate for governments to have integrated joint up policies, which was the point in the presentation. From the Minister Morris to that there. It's a cross cutting thing. It's no good delivering this in one box, this box or that box. Jersey's got an issue. That, that issue requires joining, and that's the thing for the government. But as it's going to happen, um, I disagree a little bit with William that all politicians are career politicians. Personally, my experience has been there are career politicians, too many of them, but they are conviction politicians. They're um, certainly noticed. What's changed things now is the message that's got across to the people, the, the understanding of it, and that's putting pressure on public. I think that needs to be harnessed because without that, and really to be accelerated. And so I think if you guys anybody, so I think it's a great lesson today. I've got the answers. And one quick question for do, do the panel agree to those are the right lines? If you go that policy. Uh, and cross cutting is very positive. There's somewhere over there. I can't cross you. We have to open the questions and thank you, Paul. I'm going to hand over now to the role of the man. Hi. Thank you, Danny. You're doing great. So you can be falling over. <laughs> right, ladies and gentlemen, we're almost at the end of the day. There's one final presentation. Uh, Conclusion of the Wild Rabbit Conference and the Blue Island Summit, and this will be given by um, uh, this cell. <laughs> uh, James, are we on? You are switched on, you are. Try that. Oh, sorry, don't touch it, just talking to it. Talking to it. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, we thought we'd do a two-hander for this, but we've done no 
planning, rehearsal, or agenda for it. So it could go hugely well, or it might not do. Um, so I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, which is my coded message to Liesl for what I think we're going to do. Um, so uh, I'm going to say a few words a little bit of what we were doing um, at lunchtime. Um, uh, and then I'm going to ask Lisa to say a bit more of that, about that, and where we want to head with the development of the Blue Islands Charter. Um, uh, and, and perhaps we'll both take the opportunity to throw one or two reflections in on the conference as a whole as we do that. Um, and I wanted to start, first of all, just by reflecting on the point that came up in the last discussion about um, the pace of change. Can we change as a society quickly enough to meet the challenges that we know are out there around environmental threats? Um, and that's, I think, a really interesting question because um, economics do come into it, as well as all of the behavioural stuff that people have talked about. You know, are we prepared to sacrifice our cars? Um, I just reflect on what happened in the UK and indeed much of Europe in the early 2000s, where the whole efforts to remove dependence on landfill for disposal of waste and um, really gripped what we had to do. But what you'll find in the UK is that this accelerated many local authorities um, into going into an, a new arrangement for usually for incineration of waste um, and for separating out recyclables. Um, but it was all done on a con contracting basis. So the model was an economic one. Uh, and everybody therefore was tied into a contract of 25 or 30 years. Um, now that accelerated very quickly the issues over dealing with landfill and with recycling, but it also froze everybody in a rather slow pace of change beyond that. And I think this is part of the problem we have to deal with. It's a bit like pharmaceuticals. We expect the pharmaceutical companies to invest up front to develop the drugs. They then want 15 or 20 years to get the money back for the investment they've made. Uh, and I think the big challenge <coughs> for us is that actually we may not have that time because that's a steady state strategy and we may not be in that position. So I think if one thing that I'm reflecting on as a consequence of what has been said is, are there other types of models we could adopt? Um, so that, that, that's my initial reflection, but the really important thing that happened at lunchtime is that we all left here for a very, very, very important political summit. Um, as ever with these things, uh, it was a smoke-filled room and a lot of very hard bargaining and arguing. Actually, no, it wasn't. We had a game of dominoes in all these things. <laughs> that's the time. Um, but the, the result is, um, pre-prepared, is, is, is the signing. The first seven signatories out of 20. Um, uh, on this uh, Blue Islands Environmental Charter. And the charter is um, a, a whole set of guiding principles for the protection of island communities. And it sets out a number of commitments that we are committing to each island community um, about our own islands and how we deal with some of these challenges, um, but also about how we work together to develop the scientific knowledge um, and the impact that we need to make collectively across the globe uh, in terms of bringing to the attention of everybody else in the world the, the particular importance and the particular challenges for small island communities. Um, so we're trying to develop a collaborative collective voice for island communities so that um, our special position is understood and recognised. And I'll hand over to, to, to Lisa to perhaps uh, explain a bit more about um, this, where it came from, and where we hope it will be going to. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody who's been here. It's my second time in Albany. Definitely won't be my last. Um, and despite my um, travel adventures to get here, I <laughs> cannot. This place doesn't ever fail to inspire me. And when you get very, very small islands punching above their weight, then it's, for me, it's like an adrenaline that keeps me going. So this charter has been discussed. Um, <coughs> I can say that I've been very privileged, and the word really is privileged, to work with a series which started the council, 
politics being what they are, they're no longer parts of the council, but we've got new men at these group of individuals meeting. It blows me away because islands get it. Islands really do get it. I, again, was very honored to represent the United Kingdom overseas territories in COP in Poland um, 10 months ago. And it was bizarre. We were part of Her Majesty's delegation, which was the first time the overseas territories were an equal part and member of Her Majesty's delegation. And we were there with world leaders who were negotiating texts on the different articles of the Paris Agreement. And they were arguing over one word. And it wasn't even that important to work. And you almost feel like stepping up and starting, you know, slapping people and saying, seriously, <laughs> we're talking about the future of the planet and this is the word that upsets you? So for me, having worked for over 20 years in islands and promoting island work in island collaboration, the Environment Minister's Council is amazing. Um, and it's inspirational. And I honestly feel that this is just the latest example of their unwavering commitment to do good and to get it right. We talk about the fact that in a lot of islands, in a lot of territories, of course they have other issues that are of concern. They need to put food on the plate like we heard. They need to make sure that they can send their children to school. But as the ever hopeless optimist in me, you just need one individual. I honestly believe this, and we've seen it in Gibraltar. We've seen it in other islands. You need one individual, doesn't need to be a minister, with that drive, that passion, that commitment to drive these changes through and to make a difference. And I'm happy to say we have more than one in, in each of the territories, or the UK island family, as I'm trying to call it that term now. So this charter, it was ideally or intentionally, we were hoping to have it signed in Gibraltar during the island games. But fortunately, very, very fortunately, that did not happen at that time. Some of our speakers fell away, but Aldini, has been the amazing place where it has started. And as an islander, and I know we're a peninsula, but bloody hell do we have to behave like islanders. <laughs> um, um, I honestly consider myself an islander. Any island who does the right thing, it doesn't matter if it's Gibraltar, if it's Guernsey, if it's Jersey, if it's Montserrat. If we work together and we use our collective effort, then we can absolutely sing like a choir and believe you me, could do well and would do well to listen to islands and to learn from islands because we know what we need to do, we know the problems we face, but we're too small. Individually, we are too small. And one of the things that frustrated me the most in Poland, I was there with uh, Dr. Pickering, which was the former Deputy Premier of BBI, and there was this massive company, which shall remain nameless, who focuses on offshore wind. So Dr. Pickering gets up and says, you know, have you thought about investment in some of the smaller islands and territories? And the CEO gets up and says, well, with all due respect, you're too small for us. We work with gigawatts and you only need a few megawatts at best. And everybody in that auditorium sort of turned around and said, have you really said that out loud? Because, <laughs> but that question was asked on purpose to drive a point. So as islands, and as what this charter signifies is our collective journey. Together, we are stronger and we can make a point. Um, some of us have been talking about, in the last few days, a collective unspoken motto that we all have in any island, and that is, where there's a will, there's a way. We don't have time for all of this bureaucracy sometimes in islands. We have a problem, you get up and you deal with it, and you help your fellow islanders. because. That is what you have to do. So where there's a will, there's a way, and that is something that we all share, and boy, do we have a will. So as the hopeless optimist in me, and knowing the individuals and the momentum that the Environment Minister's Council has started four years ago and continue, <coughs> continues to drive, this will not be another paper on a politician's desk. I can honestly, hand in my heart, say that. Because the Environment Minister's Council will ensure that it's not. 
Um, we're already talking about targets. There's going to be another meeting hopefully in Gibraltar in 2020. And we've got some environmental politicians that run like cheaters. My <laughs> minister being one of them. So I can honestly say that we will work our hardest, our downness, to make sure that on an individual personal level, but representing our collective communities, that this will start with the UK, UK overseas territory and the Crown dependencies. But hey, why are we going to stop there? You know, we are a member of GESPA, Global Island Partnership. Let's go bigger. If we could start something here that would get global island sign up, yes, it's by these <coughs> principles. So what if it's not legally binding? It's about our personal choices, as the President Chaudhary was saying. So I think my message, which is what I've picked up from this conference, I've seen countless examples of island collaboration, island resilience, innovation, and our ability to be to think outside the box. And that is our greatest strength. So I honestly believe that this is just another example, and you know we we will get there. It's just that simple. We don't have the time, but human ingenuity can be a great thing if it's got the right motivation. So with the right people in the room, and I think we have them in this room, I have honestly no doubt that we will do, and we will get what we need to do. And if islands, excuse the phrase, the little people in the world could teach the larger nations what to do and hold them to answer, then so be it. And if we have to work with big business and the big corporations and the ones that have historically caused the biggest damage, but now are trying to change it, let's embrace that. Let's get the right companies to say, well, you know, Gibraltar on its own, not worth the investment. But at a European level, Gibraltar on the Channel Islands, maybe yes. Or at Caribbean level, hang on, I can set up some wind farms. Or how about Montserrat <coughs> selling geothermal energy to other islands in the region? It's not rain, and you know Montserrat is looking at it. So if we use our geographies, you know, as, as one way of working together, then we're there, guys. I'm sorry I can really be optimistic and naive, but trust me, we need to think in this manner. Yeah. <laughs> so, there's just one more thing I'd like to say um, to, to Captain Lovell, because I think Lisa has very effectively explained to us how we are both island citizens but global citizens too. Um, and it's been an absolute pleasure for this tiny little bit of the globe called Alderney to host this conference. And we are absolutely indebted to the Alderney Wildlife Trust for what they have done uh, to, to bring us here. And I just want to say thank you not only to Roman, but to everybody involved in the Trust for doing that. Because uh, those of you who, who, who've not been to Alderney before will recognise we do have some very, very different individual species. You may not have come across the Alderney blonde swan, um, but uh, it, that is that is effectively what the Wildlife Trust are. So as they glide seamlessly on the surface, <laughs> looking elegant and lovely, they are working frantically underneath, and that's been absolutely what's been behind this conference. So a very, very big thank you to them, and a very big thank you to you as delegates for coming and spending the time with us here in Alderney, and we do uh, look forward to having you back again in the future. Thank you. Especially when you, you have a wet swan, I think it's more dark. Um, <laughs> you know, like something, it's, it's not elegant. Um, I'm pretty sure you've all seen this lovely around the place. But getting this conference together with all the items involved, uh, with all of you offering ideas, thoughts, bearing to communicate for a few months at a time, all those usual things in, in conference organizing is, is always a huge, huge challenge. To include a political component like this in, it, uh, in the conference has been an additional challenge. However, to see the positions coming together and our governments coming together to make some decisions that really do have the potential, if we decide to support that action, has been a, a true pleasure. Um, we have a charter that can start the process alongside many other processes that are already running. 
Um, and getting towards the end of a, a conference, which I found a complete pleasure to be involved in, um, I would like to just, just leave one passing or one, one challenge to you as the delegates uh, before I, I deal with the final few housekeeping keeping pieces uh, of the day. And that is, I would like to ask all delegates that have been involved in the conference to leave uh, us an outcome. I want to, to hear back from you all. Um, just an outcome that you think has been worthwhile. <coughs> um, one would be fine. A good one would be even better. But if you could send us that, uh, and we'll be asking all delegates by email, uh, email to, to do that for us. Because I think it's so important to continue what is taking place here today. We've all done this before. Maybe not the charter, maybe not the individual points and conversations, the new people we've met. We all attend conferences, we all take the opportunity to meet wherever we get the, the chance. It's too valuable for us. But so often when we walk away from the room, the opportunity is gone. So if you could give us that one last uh, one last favour, I'd be incredibly grateful to you all. So in terms of the conference, I think we're at a close. Thank you all again so much for attending. Uh, I think a round of applause for yourselves, yes. <laughs>